And the topic is the, the future of innovative regions. So Manfred Horvath, do we see any future for innovative regions in Europe? Yes. Yes, okay, so <laughs> Manfred Horvath. So, okay, we are coming towards the end. I would like to tell you first how we organized it. I will say a few uh, encouraging, positive uh, sentences at the beginning. Then we will have two minutes, e two minutes each from the rapporteurs of the session, and then I will round up the whole thing, and we hope to be ready within 20 minutes, so it might be then the first time that we could keep the time. Well, for my, I have a very short introduction, and I would like to say that, first of all, I very much appreciated the absolutely positive atmosphere not only with respect to salt mines and so on, the positive atmosphere of this conference. And with positive atmosphere, uh, I, I mean that this was really uh, headed by an uh, optimistic uh, approach. And I liked very much that one of the speakers, I think it was Mr. Klotz, had a slide which is not typical for European conferences, namely a slide with European strength. You know, and I'm sure you agree with me, that very often we start all our deliberations with excessive discussions about of all our weaknesses. I sometimes call this uh, Euromasochism. We like to talk about our weaknesses, but we forget of, 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 uh, about our strengths. And I would like to repeat what was said, as I remember right. First of all, we have an excellent research landscape in Europe that holds for the universities, that holds for the research centers, but that holds also for excellent companies, both big and small companies. And I think we should uh, exploit these uh, basic requirements for innovation. We have a well-developed market, by the way, the largest of the world. Europe is characterized, and there we come to the regional the dimension, by proximity. There are no long distances uh, wherever you go. So, and this is also uh, an excellent precondition for collaboration and for innovation. And Europe is also uh, able and capable to deal with complexity. And by the way, I would say that the framework program, the framework programs starting from FP1, I can only testify starting with FP2, uh, but starting from FP1, were an excellent, are an excellent training laboratory for collaboration, for dealing with complex problems, and also we are excellent prepared uh, with respect to the next programming period and coping with all the challenges. So let's keep this attitude starting from the strength and of course working also against our weaknesses, but this positive aspect I think is very important. So this was just to give a positive kickoff and I would like now to go to move towards our rapporteurs. And the first one is, and is Colomb Varin, if I am right. And please tell us also which your, um, your session were, uh, was, and uh, you have about two minutes. Okay, please. thank you very much. 
Um, so I was a rapporteur for the, se the plenary session uh, moderated by Clara de la Torre, challenge of smart specialization for European regions. And I suppose that you remember well that we had a very good um, uh, number of panelists. The first one, uh, Alice Gdamus, really explained us uh, the role of the smart specialization platform and uh, the different uh, uh, steps that, he, that has been set up to really organize how each region in Europe could set up the priorities for research and innovation at their own level. I, so he explained really the process, and I think it was a very interesting way to uh, understand how it is. We had questions furthermore about what are the deadlines when uh, each region has to really set up his smart specialization uh, strategy. And I know that there are um, some regions that are already more advanced than others, but it's a process that among the whole panelists um, uh, had a very good and positive um, outcome. Uh, then we also discussed, I mean, one way of really developing the smart specialization in each uh, region by having a better networking uh, aspect. Networking aspect not only at the level of member states and regions, but also at the level of um, the business sector, so the, really the involvement of entrepreneurs, and um, mention of clusters has also been done during this um, session. Another aspect that has to be highlighted was really um, the fact that if many regions face the similar challenges, some regions have really to find a tailor-made uh, way to uh, tackle them, and that was mentioned uh, with the name of flexibility, which was strongly pointed out. Um, last but not least, I think that Lambert van Nistelrooy insisted on the fact that uh, the smart specialization process has to be a bottom-up approach, and he really turned to the audience saying that uh, power is in your hands, your regions present here in the wire in Krakow today. Uh, so I wanted maybe to uh, end with this um, word. Okay. Sorry, we move on immediately to. Hmm, where's my. Sorry, all my papers. <laughs> uh, to the next one on. Uh, ah, on my. We, 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 we are sitting in a different order. I would like to me, move to Ivan uh, Tosic from the parallel session on you just speak yes okay uh, it was a very interesting session and uh, it's interesting to have a session for cities in yeah. this in this topic uh, and uh, in my opinion we were not so optimistic than you are uh, first of all the session showed a lot of uh, important possibilities how cities can contribute to innovation in Europe. Uh, it is clear that cities and economic innovation are very different topics. So cities are working in a different way how the economic uh, innovation is functioning. Cities should be part of the normal innovation process through the triple helix and uh, the, this was emphasized many times. But cities can initiate special urban-related and inclusive innovation processes where the cities have to be the leaders, for example, regarding uh, social services and, uh, uh, and this kind of stuff. Wise mayors can do a lot to change the normal way of development. Now, in the session it was clear that serious obstacles exist which hinder cities in playing their potential role in innovation. In the opinion of the meeting, uh, the 2013 cohesion policy regulations, the very strict thematic coordination mm -hmm. uh, hinders the freedom of cities to find out their way how to, how to make further development. Uh, the Barca report seems to be forgotten. Barca said, if you remember the, his yeah. famous report from three or four years ago, mm -hmm. that it should be the territorial level which brings together different European policies. This seems to be forgotten now in the new policy development. The European model of cities should be the starting point for, for further development. Uh, 
many people said that the change of focus, uh, cohesion policy will get some, a bit less money. Uh, Horizon 2020, smart cities will get more money. That these changing priorities will further strengthen the uncoordinated nature of sectoral policies. And there is also an opinion that this will deepen the divide between the different parts of Europe. So a lot of efforts are needed on European level to avoid this unfortunate development to happen. Uh, the Horizon 2020 is raising some ideas against the innovation divide, and this is, this is very positive. For example, networking. But how, how will you do networking? I just raised the idea of the, of the Urbect projects where I am now working with. In Urbect, if you establish a cooperation between cities, it is a compulsory rule that half of the cities should come from convergence regions and half should come from competitiveness regions. If this would not be a compulsory rule, the networks would not function in that way and the situation would, con would continue that Dutch, Swedish, UK and French regions are talking to each other, which is very nice otherwise, but this would not need European financing in my opinion. So compulsory networking would be one of the ideas. And then obviously, uh, the other ideas like uh, European research uh, area chairs, researcher mobility, city collaboration are good ideas, but probably not enough. In, the, in our opinion, cities and functional urban areas are in a key position to assure integration. So it is, a, it is again a question for us, what is the territorial dimension, uh, dimension if the regions are taken out from Horizon 2020 and the money of Horizon 2020 is almost doubled? Where will be the territorial dimension? So I think we have to think more about that. Uh, there is a new idea of integrated territorial investments in, in cohesion policy. How will this reflect to the regional innovation strategies? No one really attached this problem that on one hand mm -hmm. the regions are given some role, on the other hand the cities are given some role, and in the meantime technical programs are developed without any territorial dimension. So. Uh, for me, it was a bit surprising that the territorial dimension was missing, and in my opinion, uh, there is a high-speed development in the different DGs of the Commission to do their own work without real collaboration. Sorry for this not-so-positive mm -hmm. picture. Okay, it was your conclusion from your session. Maybe we have some time afterwards to discuss this still. So, we move on to Stefan Weyers now. It's your turn. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, in our session, we were, in the session four, we were talking about centers of excellence as innovation drivers in less developed regions, and we presented some success stories and lessons learned from the research potential program. Uh, there were five uh, projects presenting uh, themselves as case studies or success stories. I do not want to come back to all the technical details of that, but they were covering quite a representative sample about the program, uh, scientifically speaking, from life science, uh, organic electronics to uh, uh, renewable energies, and covering also different countries, country groups, uh, and uh, project formats from the main call, the main action line of research potential to some uh, special calls dedicated to Western Balkans and Mediterranean partner countries. Um, I would just like to recap some common findings, what we could identify as a kind of a common denominator or a more generalized uh, conclusion. First of all, uh, we can agree that uh, for all projects who took part and will be selected uh, after the, the, the last evaluation that just uh, closed a couple of weeks ago, they will all, for them the research potential program has been and will be the entrance, entrance gate uh, two uh, EU research activities within the FP7 or within the future Horizon 2020, and in particular the uh, access to networks. It turned out, uh, based on the experience, that the crucial, a crucial importance for all of that, for developing scientific excellence in less favored region, is to attract talents, to attract mm -hmm. talented, experienced researchers particularly the ones who could 
be what we call the, could be the kind of PI, the principal investigator, who would mm -hmm. be able to set up, set up autonomously a research group. And, but it was difficult to achieve it, but the efforts paid off. And we have seen a lot of examples where the coordinators took strong efforts and successfully achieved that. Um, this will help to turn the tide from the brain drain to brain gain. But the, the human resources measures cannot be alone standing successful because there's also a need for technology. And uh, they were complemented by significant investments in research infrastructure, in laboratory investment, which does not mean that we spend the money to build new laboratories somewhere on the green meadows. No, it was often such a complementary investment, for instance, to increase measurement accuracy, to increase the throughput of samples or whatever, to make these uh, research entities competitive or competitive again. And that's why they became attractive for industry collaboration, for becoming a partner and to get invited to, uh, to bids for uh, in the thematic priorities and also become uh, members of technology initiatives or even large infrastructure networks. Um, the, the, the third pillar was actually visibility, because that is very important. There are sometimes the hidden jewels somewhere in the so-called conversion region that are not known, but they are excellent. And therefore, the program also supported some kind of scientific events, in some cases currently, which developed into a brand and increased the visibilities. Measurable impacts were actually, uh, uh, could be observed in, in many cases, for instance, an increase of publications, but also patents, increase of the headcount of researchers, and of course, increased success rates in uh, bidding, uh, taking part in a proposal uh, consortia. Another component is the partnership with other countries, with uh, excellent top-class research centers elsewhere, uh, where we had um, very sustainable partnerships at the mutual benefit, though the knowledge transfer was not one way road, it was a mutual exchange of knowledge and of benefit, and a lot of these um, a partnering organization took part enthusiastically without taking an immediate financial benefit. Uh, then we saw good examples for sustainable par uh, involvement of regional stakeholders uh, and also uh, the industry, uh, which is uh, very important. Um, we managed also, and we observed by two examples, that this uh, success model could have been successfully transferred even outside the European Union, particular to the Western Balkan countries and the Mediterranean partner countries in North Africa. Um, we, we can say that in particular Western Balkan, uh, some of these research communities uh, were retained in the European research networks and uh, the PROCOM contributed uh, that they were not decoupled completely uh, from the European research after the war. Um, for the future, of course, that is always the question, um, there, there will be the objective to transfer uh, this know-how and these objectives into the new uh, cohesion policy, uh, where some uh, further money can be leveraged and, and we will certainly uh, have to establish some of these principles and their ob objectives in a newly shaped uh, uh, cohesion policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, ver Thank you very much. Uh, we move on to Sultan Palok. Sultan Palok from uh, the, for the parallelization five, role of innovation regions, innovative regions and networks in the innovation union. Sultan. Thank you very much. Um, I have just short slides what happened in our session, which was uh, dealing with the issue um, how the regions and networks can participate in the Innovation Union and the success of the Innovation Union in the uh, future. Uh, we had uh, five different speakers. They contributed to the session with different perspectives uh, from EU level, from uh, regional level, and also from uh, uh, network uh, perspective as well. 
Uh, we had a specific contribution um, from the EIT focusing on the uh, kicks and their role as innovation factories in the, uh, in the um, future implementation of the innovation union. And also uh, we had a, a specific contribution from one of the member of the smart specialization uh, platform uh, mirror group um, on how the S3 strategies uh, can contribute uh, um, more from a cohesion policy perspective to the innovation union success. Um, but more uh, interestingly, from local level, from a cluster perspective, you could hear an interesting contribution from uh, Reza Zadeh how um, clusters can contribute to the innovation union, but what is the success factor of a cluster uh, to contribute uh, efficiently uh, through um, an, the necessary management uh, uh, of clusters as well to the, to the innovation union. Uh, we had a cross-border uh, perspective as well from, from Elsass Upper Rhine uh, region uh, where we could uh, uh, have concrete examples of uh, cross-border projects and uh, initiatives. And also uh, Richard Tufts from the Airwind Network uh, gave us a, a different regional perspective how uh, regions together as a network can, uh, can contribute to the success of the Innovation Union. And especially Richard uh, stressed the importance of uh, of uh, the, uh, the networks, how uh, they can uh, lobby for uh, the territorial dimension um, in the Horizon 2020 and in the Innovation Union as well. Uh, an important common point uh, was that uh, um, how these different partnership approaches uh, can lead us to an Innovation Union uh, we could hear about the networks, about the clusters, the S3 strategy, the innovation factories, the CBC cooperation. All of them are based on partnership. But one important factor is that we can establish different partnership approaches. But the most important issue is that if these partnerships will be sustainable, if these partnerships uh, uh, will uh, ensure uh, a proper implementation for the innovation union or not. That is the main issue and, uh, and that is the main challenge for the future um, to, to make all these partnership approaches uh, efficient uh, for the real implementation of the innovation union. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we move on and we come now to uh, where is he? Uh, Richard, uh, Richard Granger uh, and he will report on the plenary session A6, actors and instruments in regional innovation ecosystems. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Manfred. As this was a session on uh, more practical issues around instruments and tools, uh, organized by Knowledge for Innovation and moderated by Roland Strauss, the Managing Director of Knowledge for Innovation. The main theme or main starting point for this session uh, was really a recognition that Europe faces a challenge and the challenge is simply that Europe must not only invent but must also take to market. Research is necessary but is not sufficient. We have also to find ways to turn that research into commercial results. We looked at three ways to respond to that challenge. First was the financial dimension. And here we noted that the support instruments that are available are evolving as we speak towards instruments which are more strongly aimed at supporting that making money out of ideas, the, the commercialization step, and in particular, crossing the valley of death, aimed at all, state, all types of company, but particularly at small and medium enterprises and indeed at, uh, at the mid-cap sector. And so we looked at the evolving situation as far as EU instruments are concerned for equity participation, for risk sharing and so forth. And we also touched on the evolving role of Eureka. Um, been around for a long time, but moving now in this direction of being uh, aimed more at supporting the commercialization of, of the results of research. Second dimension was a regional dimension. The key message for me there was that really regions have to be innovative in the way that they support innovation in their policies, their strategies, their structures and so forth. We heard two very good examples of that from uh, two 
perhaps leading regions, but nevertheless regions which are still trying to get even better. And so this would involve, for example, uh, things looking like uh, new ways of, of using public-private partnerships, new ways of using public procurement. But a theme that came out very strongly was the idea of being uh, developing a culture of more openness and more collaboration, particularly collaboration beyond the borders of the region. Third response was the social dimension. We were reminded very strongly that it's necessary to reach beyond discussions around regional policy and go down to the level of individual workplaces and individual people because ultimately policy effectiveness depends upon people and on their attitudes and unless people have the right attitudes no policy is really going to have much of an impact and therefore we have to pay attention to the need to develop social values social attitudes which support innovation difficult but necessary Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we move on to Lukas Janssen from the Parallel Session 7, which uh, addressed the issues of tackling societal challenges. Lukas. I think you just, you just have to start to speak. It is not working. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Yes, we, um, uh, in our session, uh, we started with a more general overview uh, done by Mr. De Giulio, uh, in which he uh, indicated that the, uh, uh, that the way to tackle the grand societal challenges would be by promoting uh, a challenge-driven approach and uh, also by providing effective policy and technology options um, uh, to these challenges that are also socially optimal. Uh, as well, um, fostering a comprehensive approach involving member states and stakeholders is important, and that should then lead to this uh, bioeconomy strategy. Then we had uh, three presentations uh, focused uh, more from a regional perspective. We had the example of Wuch, uh, where um, the main message was to continue supporting uh, exi existing uh, branches and developing uh, technologies. Um, the perspective from South Moravia was a bit different because there it started with the difficult situation in which South Moravia uh, was uh, in the beginning of this millennium <clears throat> where they had high uh, unemployment, uh, industrial decline and low foreign investments. So their answer was developing um, an, a regional innovation policy which, had, uh, which was uh, updated regularly and that has uh, given good results. Uh, for example, 55 startups, uh, uh, new employment uh, and uh, they also, for example, developed smart specialization strategies for the region uh, and they attracted uh, a number of high, of excellent uh, researchers. Uh, I think it's very important what also they said, they had a clear vision and a, a, a clear ambition to belong to the 50 uh, most inv innovative regions in Europe in 2013. Um, the perspective from uh, Vastre uh, Gotteland in uh, Sweden uh, was more focused on the life sciences, on, on health. And uh, one of the issues that came out of that is that you need uh, a healthy population and that healthcare uh, is an innovation uh, gateway. Uh, <clears throat> several barriers to uh, innovation in the healthcare system were mentioned uh, and uh, discussed. <clears throat> And then the last presentation uh, we had uh, focused uh, on the view from, uh, of, uh, from the industry. And um, in that presentation, it uh, was indicated why uh, industry will invest in biotechnology. That's not only to, uh, to stay ahead of com in competition, but also to finance fruit, uh, future growth, to have enough uh, funds available for, uh, for investing and, uh, in future growth. Uh, then we looked at the uh, benefit for the region, uh, where it, for example, is uh, in employment for highly skilled uh, employees directly, but of course there's also much uh, indirect uh, employment from uh, 
uh, investments in biotechnology. Uh, and uh, regarding the benefits for the country, it creates uh, a lot of also opportunities. Afterwards, we had a, a discussion with the audience and uh, uh, several issues came up, but uh, it was mainly discussed that we need uh, a healthy population in order to, uh, to be productive, but also that public health is very important, not only from the point of view from uh, well-being at work, but also uh, well-being through work uh, together. And that's also one of the ways um, uh, in which maybe uh, it was also mentioned that the economy normally always wins, which was meant that it's always the economic factors which are dominant, but there are also other aspects which uh, play a role as well, and uh, well-being uh, is one of them. Okay, thank you, Lucas. Uh, the next speaker is myself. I was in, uh, also the rapporteur of Parallelization 8 on synergies between uh, Horizon 2020 and the cohesion policy. <clears throat> we talked, and this was a, a main point, was on the one side a clear division of labor, so clear in the future, clear profiles of the two EU instruments, one for excellence and the other one for capacity building and providing stairways to a, towards excellence, which in, 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 a, in a certain way already means also building bridges. The most important point uh, that we addressed was certainly the question of interoperability. Uh, there is an excellent cooperation between the different DGs in the Commission but due to the different ways the programs are organized and implemented, the interoperability will certainly still be a challenge also in the future. Uh, the second point was, which went across the whole discussion, was that the new approaches uh, and to make the Europe 2020, the innovation union uh, policies and Horizon 20 and uh, 2020 and the cohesion policy instruments to make them a reality will need new quality of collaboration at all levels. I mentioned already the Commission. In the preparation, there's very good uh, uh, cooperation that has to be continued in the implementation. But it will also need a new type of collaboration at national and regional level involving all uh, stakeholders, all major actors, actors, the representatives of the triple helix in the implementation of the knowledge triangle. So in order, a wonderful sentence, in order to uh, cope with the challenges of the non-linear character of the innovation process. Hmm? Perfect. So, uh, there is also another aspect. We have quite a few uh, uh, support structures, intermediaries, and so on, uh, responsible for the different schemes in the different uh, community instruments, and also there we will need uh, a, a new quality of collaboration. Uh, <clears throat> a next interesting point was pointed out by Ms. Reppel from uh, TG Enterprise, and that was the necessity to concert of concertation of different instruments. Uh, we have, we, we focus also this conference, of course, to cohesion policy and Horizon 2020, but we should not forget that there are also other instruments like Eureka, it was mentioned already, COSME and others. Uh, and by the way, there was a very important point from two speakers, from Turkey, but also from Poland, with respect to the, and from the Netherlands, with respect to the importance of the regions of knowledge instrument uh, scheme that is now in the FDFP7. I have to confess that the synergies group where I was the rapporteur made the proposal, the suggestion to move the two regional instruments, the region of knowledge and RECPOT uh, to the structural funds. So there, was, there are discussions on that, uh, but there was also the point that <coughs> in the future 
we should also stronger consider the, the possibilities of the EIT, of the co-location centers, of the knowledge and innovation communities, uh, which would include also this bridging aspect, that aspect of local global uh, uh, connectiveness. Uh, and a, a final point I would say to make it short was there was a statement, all the instruments are there, we just have to make optimal use of it. Yeah? Obviously, this is, uh, this is still a challenge because we see that there is this urgent request for broadening the, uh, the participation, the involvement of the new member states. That is an issue and we will certainly have to deal with it. But as we see the potential of the future stronger synergies, coordination, cooperation, and concertation between especially Horizon 2020 and uh, the Cohesion Fund will also be uh, a means and will provide uh, ways and means to, uh, to, to widen the participation and at the end to make the European research area or I would say the European research, innovation and higher education a reality. So this was the report of Manfred Robert for session eight. Uh, we move on now to session nine. And last but not least, I give the floor to Kairan Dörl. <coughs> okay, it's working. Thank you, Manfred. Session nine dealt with innovative partnerships of European regions. We had six speakers and we managed to divide the, the issue into three broad packages. Firstly, the EU policy context. Secondly, some perspectives on regional partnership, and thirdly, a number of practical projects. Taking the first one, EU policy context, it was noted that collaborative development of research is, is too low in, uh, in Europe, around 15%. Most of it is concentrated in the member states themselves. So how can we change this? There are two, two issues that were really addressed. Everything to do with era nets, and of course, joint programming. So taking the, the era nets first, to, and the member states are just uh, looking uh, among themselves to see how they can use the Euronet structure in order to increase collaboration. Euronet Plus, the Commission joins in. And then the, 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 the deepest level of collaboration is under the Article 185 process, where you have much closer integration, a single agency, and as was said, irrevocable commitment. Don't join up unless you're committed. In terms of some practical um, examples, uh, we have in the domain of uh, Article 185 the whole issue of legal metrology. It's, a, it's an area that is ripe for, for further integration and further collaborative uh, development. Then, in regard to Iranets specifically, there was a very, very detailed explanation from the Basque Country of an Iranet called Manunet, which is working in, as its name suggests, in the manufacturing sector. And through the sort of operations of uh, Iranets of this type, there can be very, very significant multiplier effects which are to be, uh, are to be welcomed. Joint programming then is, is a relatively new uh, issue for us, but one that will be very greatly developed under Horizon 2020. And as we all know, it relates to turning the grand societal challenges into real collaboration uh, between the member states in terms of setting agendas, sharing burdens, uh, etc. So this is very important. This wasn't mentioned during the session, but I would like to suggest that uh, while we're talking about uh, stair stairways or staircases, usually in terms of staircases to excellence or stairways to excellence, we could see that this whole process is the, is the stairway to, to regional partnership. Then we had two presentations on the more practical issues related to partnership, um, which indicated, they indicated that there is a challenge. Partnership is a grand idea, but difficult to turn into, into practical realities as has been indicated through Eurobarometer surveys and surveys uh, undertaken also by the Regional Innovation Monitor, which came to the curious conclusion in the latter case that it was largely too early to tell about the real uh, impact of regional partnerships. So there's a lot of work to do. However, the good news is that progress was also reported by our speakers in terms of partnership in the Baltic and uh, Nordic countries, and also specifically the Open Arena project in West Sweden. Overall from this section, two messages came out. One is that in partnership, you always have more to gain than you have to lose. And secondly, uh, 
quoting, and I must say this was not my, my quotes, I'm quoting from the colleague, um, echoing John Kennedy, ask not what partnership can do for you, but what you can do for partnership. Finally, and very briefly, we had presentations of two practical specific projects in the two domains that very, very closely are involved in the issue of partnership, regions of knowledge and Interreg 4C. First, the Log for Green project, a regions of knowledge project in the transport domain from two years ago. A very diversified partnership was indicated in every sense, geography, business culture, and the maturity of the industry. And a specific example, because the, the speaker was from Turkey, is of the Istanbul uh, region and the challenge of developing transport policy in Istanbul. Finally, no hub, a new project under Interreg 4C, just starting, so not much to report yet. However, a broad partnership is being developed and it's collaborating for better regional competence. One final point made by the speaker is the key issue of implementation of plans. When we have regions of knowledge plans or Interreg 4C plans, all of these nice ideas coming out of the projects, the important thing is to see that they're implemented on the ground. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Kayan. So I'm afraid we didn't keep the 20 minutes, I have to confess. So we have to be very short in, in wrapping up. First of all, I would thank the rapporteurs for the richness of their conclusions, and they will send their papers to the coordinator of this conference, to Andre Shimashko, and on the basis of the conclusions of the reports and the conclusions, uh, the uh, final paper, a report on the conference will be prepared. I will not try to, to find, to, to, to make some final conclusions, uh, to wrap up what was, his, what, or maybe repeat was what uh, uh, has been said here. I just would like to say the following. Well, of course, this is a, 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 a meeting where we don't have to con, convince anybody about the, con, the, the importance of the regions. But we have to be clear that the regions are in the core of the future development. And I would say, and I'm grateful for the critical remark of Istvan, and the cities. And probably this will be still a challenge to cope with the different aspects and challenges of the regions on the one side and the, and the cities on the other side. Uh, we talked a lot about the concept of smart specialization and also the conditionality that in the future will be uh, a core issue uh, for bringing Europe forward. The main issue is probably in general that we are now going towards a period where research and innovation are there and are the main, the main activities and also which means we have to create impact. And impact means the introduction into the market. We have talked about Horizon 2020 on the one side with the three main pillars. On the other side, the co cohesion policy funds with the different schemes available, very strong. And I would like even to separate a third, a third group of activities which were just also emphasized by Kairan. And these are the public-private partnerships. These are the joint program initiatives and the EIT. So, and these three corners, I've, I would call it the innovation triangle of Horizon 2020, of the uh, cohesion policy funds, and these partnership, uh, partnership approaches. This is something what is, will be key for the future. But one aspect we should not forget, in the center are the people. We will need, we will have to go in many cases towards mind, uh, changes of mindsets, towards innovation, towards implementation, towards market success, towards entrepreneurship. Because without that, we will not cope with the challenges that are ahead. Uh, there is an interesting book by David ha uh, Hamilton from Johns Hopkins. Uh, university on Europe 2020, and there he says the period from 2014-2020 are the, 
may be final, but are the window of opportunity for the European Union. We are preparing now probably excellent new instruments. We have to make optimal use and really go forward. It will be important that the high policy objectives that we have defined, European, Europe 2020 Innovation Union, uh, diffuse also down to the level of the regions, but even to the, in, to the individual organizations to have a clear view, a clear vision about the future of the European Union. And this joint effort, this partnership, this cooperation, which is one of our strengths, as I mentioned in, the, uh, uh, in my introduction, we will succeed. Thank you very much. Okay, so I would like to invite to the stage uh, Mateusz Gaczyński, uh, Mark Markula, Imelda Lampkin. Could I also ask uh, Clara de la Torre? It's, it's just uh, the final moment of our... Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, so the final moments of our conference, why 2012? I would like to also to identify two, two areas which still need some, some more elaboration for sure. So it's, it's one, one area is of course this territorial dimension of, of horizon. This, this was many discussions that we need something more. So Marco, could you just a few minutes to, 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 to say about this. And, and uh, where is Mateusz Gaczyński? Please join us. Marco, ju yeah. just to, to summarize. So this, is, this is yeah. something that, that we need more, more work and, and few words about this. Right, I have, a, I have a few slides there as well. So I'll very quickly go through those five slides only and uh, kind of summing up. So what I have learned during these two days and then as well, pointing out uh, what is already going on, where, let's say, my and several of the other colleagues, how we are operating within the Committee of the Regions, really, to get the, the, the regions to take more active role. Uh, the feedback, actually, uh, starting with so that, that uh, let's see how I move on. There it goes. Right, um, a few key points so from, from this uh, kind of lessons learned. So what definitely I need to take strongly back to the Committee of the Region is, is that Europe uh, uh, needs as well uh, pioneering regions, which need to focus more, more on really collaborative learning, which I can call bench learning. So having the data there, but as well go much deeper on that, learning from the best practices and how to apply those to the different cultural environments. Then uh, more and more of these European partnerships, both through Horizon, but especially now we need to open up cohesion policy and instruments there to fund that the regions are using the money as well for integrating their collaboration through the smart specialization uh, concept with other regions who have the same similar interests. And then we need a much deeper understanding of regional innovation ecosystem. And that goes especially on integrating the three pillars of horizon. So uh, societal challenges, industrial leadership, and, and science excellence. So we need to have through that a much better and deeper understanding how the innovation ecosystems regionally operate. And then definitely move much, uh, much more to, towards open inno innovation and see that it's, that is important as well for profitable businesses. So it's, it, it's giving much boost for uh, SMEs especially, but other, other industries as well. And then what I have there in, in, the, uh, in the picture as, as well, so 
there what I put there, what we are developing with our own university and regional campus, the virtual reality, so that we can start on working and feeling that our working environment is global, but showing on that there are, let's say, the islands for different uh, purposes. And I already have in my mind now the stairway to excellence through in between those, those islands. Um, let's jump then to the, the next here. I uh, a bit more precisely sum up a few of the points that I've, I've captured during these, uh, these uh, uh, two days. And uh, especially I, there, I in a way challenge so that we need to have not just seeing that the, the capacity building and innovation is much stronger on the, on the cohesion policy side, but it needs to be regional uh, aspects, regional dimension from our perspective definitely needs to be on the horizon as well. So to uh, deepen the understanding of regions, what is uh, research all about? What are the research outcomes? What are the processes needed for this uh, excellent research uh, outcomes? And how then to apply those to different regions with different uh, cultural and business uh, circumstances. So that is our message as well. So and then we are putting that strongly in our own COR opinion for the parliament and for the EA council as well to consider so that actually the, the content of what we have learned from regions of, of knowledge should be in horizon as well. And, and that is something really to encourage this future future uh, collaboration and outcomes. So then, then it means much better for uh, using the cohesion funding to the, uh, this uh, stairway to, to excellence as well. Uh, societal innovation, so they are not just social. Societal means that we need to be ready for some structural changes, changing laws or whatever is needed. It's seeing that on a broader scale, so we encourage strongly through the Committee of the Regions so that uh, not talk about only on so social innovations, but societal innovations as well. And uh, to show in a way uh, a bit uh, simplified our thinking, so we need these uh, pioneering regions, the understanding of the ecosystem, so every region can be a pioneer. So that this is not to say that only the best should be the pioneering ones. But what do we need there? So to get more these societal innovations, and then we need to have these different uh, kind of uh, strong inputs on the so much stronger towards open innovation, sharing the experiences, and that needs to be on a European-wide basis based on smart specialization. And on the other hand, then, digitalized real-life test beds. It came up in several presentations here. We, in a way, summing up, we need rapid prototyping. And this means, as well, urban planning is more changing towards urban design, where the people are having a very strong role. And uh, to finish my presentation with two slides, this is kind of a concept that we are operating with the, uh, our Alto University at the Helsinki region together with the, both cities and region, regional authorities strongly with industry. So kind of conceptualizing our change processes so they are moving from kind of traditional Ma machine models and, and uh, a traditional analytical approach to much more complex systems. So systems thinking is, is the basis in creating this uh, very integrating so, uh, social model that we are bringing to, to EU as well for consideration. And this is in a way our test bed where we have the, the main activities of the Alto University after the merger of Helsinki University of Technology, Helsinki School of uh, uh, Economics, and uh, University of Art and Design. So we are integrating together with the cities, with the regional authorities, and especially with the industry. We have their Nokia head office, Kone, the elevator company head office, Fortum, the largest energy company in, in Scandinavia, and so on. But we have there as well, we have Rovio, so we have the Angry Birds there, so on, so, and that is as well kind of bringing, bringing the new, new dimension to this. So the mindset issue is the key. And that is where we have a lot of these new instruments like Alto Design Factory. We are just opening in a few months a, a new open innovation house there, where as well Nokia will move their research unit. And as well with, the, with this, the, is the host of the, one of the 
EIT, uh, ICT lab nodes. And what, what, for what kind of purpose? So I stress that the key words there are to increase the renewal capital. So both personally, individuals, but as well the structures that need to be, we talked here about the triple helix, so what is the role of those actors, how to include on that the fourth and the fifth dimension, and maybe next while I will tell more about those, uh, the new dimensions on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much, Marco Marcura. So this, this was the message which we uh, transferred to, to the Committee of, of Regions. And, and now I, I would like to, to ask Mateusz Gaczyński, so, so Minister of Science and, and Higher Education in Poland. So Poland is in a specific situation. So w w uh, one position is that this is a, a, this group of, of EU 12 countries plus plus Croatia that, that we started some, some um, uh, discussion together with Hungarian colleagues about uh, um, increasing participation in, in the framework program. So th this was something that during our presidencies were, were, uh, were very clear that th this is something we have to change. So, so this, this continu is continuing by, by my, our ministry. But second, second very important message, I think, that, that, uh, which puts uh, Poland in a specific position. So we are the largest beneficiary of, of structural funds. So, so what was defined today, this cohesion policy, th this is something that, that uh, some, some significant part of this will go to Poland. And are we ready? And, and I th this is our responsibility. I'm also Polish. So responsibility, you know, to, de to define the, the very optimal way how to implement this, this cohesion policy. And this, this is also our duty to, to work very closely with the Commission to define these bridges, to, to concentrate, to, 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 to integrate in some way these two pillars. So it was said that the framework program could have something like 80 billion euro. This part uh, of, of cohesion policy, which is devoted to, to R&D activities, could be even uh, higher, so, so, so we have two pillars which have to, to work together for, for, for better Europe. Mateusz. Okay, uh, after uh, what, what you've said, uh, it almost leave me uh, no room for, for intervention, <laughs> just to uh, thank you for the organizing of the conference. But speaking uh, seriously, yes, we see the, the seriousness of the situation that we are now uh, in, uh, but we see this as a, uh, maybe one of the biggest challenges that we were faced since the change of the, uh, of the system. We had a situation where uh, around uh, Europe and in Europe there is a crisis. On the, on the other hand, we have lots of uh, very ambitious documents that uh, put on us and our uh, policy makers very heavy burden of uh, reaching some uh, targets that uh, should be reached in order to make Europe more competitive. Uh, and now we have this, uh, as I said during my presentation in, uh, in, in panel number eight, the toolbox uh, prepared by the uh, Commission. We admire very much the current work already, the, the, the work already done by the Commission. Uh, the improvements that are uh, visible right now are uh, very good from, from the perspective of the people who will write the operational programs and uh, instruments to implement Horizon, uh, to, to speed up implement uh, using uh, Horizon 2020 in Poland. Uh, the improvements are very much uh, visible and very much welcomed, but we also see uh, the room for further, uh, for further work. And we see the next couple months, the, the Cypriot and the Irish presidency uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as, as a year maybe uh, when we will discuss very deeply the, the construction of the, uh, of the whole system, of the cohesion package, of the Horizon 2020, other instruments that are uh, 
and that need to be uh, combined in, in order to, to reach all the synergies uh, that we are talking uh, that we are talking about and our deepest concern is in in my opinion uh, and and I think my opinion is, is shared by um, by my colleagues in the, within the ministry is that we need to avoid a, a, a kind of a, a kind of a trap of uh, using this very nice and uh, very promising phrases of on, on synergies uh, and uh, complementarities between uh, all the instruments because we know it works. We have uh, examples from Poland, from uh, from Holland. Uh, last week we've been with uh, I've been with, with my minister in, in uh, European Parliament when we discussed the the synergies between uh, cohesion policy and framework program, and we saw uh, examples from from Germany, from Italy, from from United Kingdom. So we so we see it can work. Uh, in uh, new member states and in old member states. It, it contributes to the development of ERA, contributes to the development of, of the single market. But in the current situation, we, we may not, uh, sorry for, for strong words, we may not uh, fall into the trap of stitching these labels of, on synergies and complementarities to the old working instruments. We need to work to develop a new instruments that could speed up the process of uh, bridging the gaps between the old member states and the new new member states between the 10% uh, of the people uh, of the sorry of the beneficiaries of the uh, framework program and the and and the 80% uh, percent that use only the 10% of the uh, of the money we cannot wait for m more years for 5 10 years uh, for for some processes to run on their on, on their natural p pace now we need to develop new instruments that will speed up those those processes in order to develop uh, to the full extent the uh, whole intellectual capital of europe both uh, new member state as uh, well as the uh, old uh, old member state and being in the ministry and uh, seeing this from the perspective of the policy making i can assure you that the uh, together with our colleagues from the 12 member states uh, and uh, sorry, 11 member states and Croatia. Uh, we will work uh, as we did uh, till the the preparation of this uh, of, of this letter. We will work in this in the direction to create this the, the new possibilities, the new instruments uh, to explain um, with the Commission and with other colleagues uh, from from the Council how the, the instruments should work because we see this next month as a big challenge and as a, as a big chance uh, in order to create uh, good conditions for the uh, regions and for the countries to, to develop. Thank you very much. So, Clara, is the Commission ready for, for such a continuous work now and using our community, so we, which was established in, in these wire conferences, and, and so to, to work together to, to improve, to, 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 to um, allow us to, to contribute to the, 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 the final uh, um, uh, instruments which, which, which are now uh, elaborated. Indeed, I think, uh, thank you, Andre. I think the, the proof that we are willing to do so is that we are here, many of us from the Commission. So that's the proof of our willingness. I would, uh, I think we have, uh, we have tendency to do that, that, that we insist too much in the things that don't go well, uh, that could be improved, and certainly many things can be improved. But I, I, would, I would invite you all to remember a couple of things that regions are at the center of innovation, nobody denies that. So the future is in your hands, in hands of the regions. That's the first thing. Second, that we are lucky enough that among all of us, it's not only the Commission writing its proposal, but it's with the feedback of all of you, we have managed to put on the table two proposals which are much more mutually friendly. There are a number of opportunities that are being opened that didn't exist before. So certainly there is always room for improvement, but let us bring home the positive message that we have two big opportunities that need to be sized. And the third thing is that we are working in, we are working regions, we'll look a little bit uh, broader, we're looking at Europe, but we have to look at the world. So let us not forget that all these things that we are doing is just for Europe to be in a better position in the world. So plenty of things that could be and should be improved, uh, made concrete, but let us not lose perspective of 
of a huge number of opportunities that we have ahead of us, and it is our common responsibility to grasp, to grasp them. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to, to show you some, a slide uh, showing the, the participants, uh, some statistics from, from the, the current uh, WIRE conference. And, and so together 372 guests and 29. I think it's, it's important that really we had very strong delegation from the Commission, from Parliament, uh, Committee of Regions, so many, many organizations, so practically all, all uh, levels of, 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 uh, of uh, authorities from, from member states, from, from, from uh, organizations from Brussels were present at, at this conference. So the message which we are bringing is very strong and, and of course we need time to elaborate it and, and then we, we come back to the, the, uh, to the Commission, to Parliament, to member states to, to, to continue work on, on, on these uh, new ideas for, for, for the future of, of uh, framework program and, and cohesion policy. So I would like to thank uh, the Commission for supporting this, this conference. <laughs> I would like to thank my, my colleagues. Uh, so again, I, I would like to invite you to this uh, stage. Kasia Sobutka, Małgosia Snarska and, and our staff. But please, please join us for organizing this conference. I hope that, that you enjoy the, the stay in Krakow. And I hope that Ireland will... <laughs> Thank you very much. Imelda, so what, what, what is the, the, the invitation from your side? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do we have my slides? Could we have the, the slide from, from Ireland? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, a very easy task for me today, uh, essentially to invite you to block the dates off in your diaries for next year. And essentially what we aim to do during the Irish presidency is to take the same week next year and to hold uh, the next iteration of WIRE, uh, WIRE 4. We'll hold that conference in Cork in the south of Ireland and I'll tell you a little bit about Cork, but just in the context of WIRE and what we think at this stage that we want to achieve, in 12 months time we'll be at a very advanced stage in terms of the legislative process. We'll have a clearer picture of what the structure uh, that we'll be working in will look like. So what we hope for the Irish presidency is to be very much in a position to then get into the nuts and bolts, the practicalities, how are we actually going to work using the system that we have in place and how will we do that very effectively. So we'll aim for a very practical approach this time next year. In terms of themes, uh, these were some of the themes that you know, we had put into our sort of thinking process prior to uh, this few days. We'll have smart specialization in there. We'll be looking at research excellence and the regional agenda. We want to go back to a full uh, section on research infrastructures, and it's been mentioned a lot over the last two days. And again, then, looking at cohesion funds, how can we optimize that performance? So we've learned a lot over the last couple of days. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of the issues that are emerging. We will be in that new environment of that sort of stabilization of knowing how the structure uh, will look this time next year, and we hope that we'll have a very interesting program for you. So just a couple of comments then on Cork. Uh, sitting here in Krakow, we've seen the incredible history with Copernicus, for example, uh, the very modern approaches that are going on. And so I just wanted to give you a feeling for Cork, also a long history in academic uh, excellence and essentially a very vibrant uh, research excellence type uh, activity going on there nowadays as well and one that we'd love to show you uh, if you come over to uh, Cork. Another draw, I think, something that might attract you to come to WIRE next year in Cork 
It is an area where we have a real cluster of multinational corporations attracted into Ireland to do their European business. And so we have a lot of big American companies, big European companies. And it is a point that is often made about Ireland. Are we closer to Boston than Berlin? And what we would like to show you is how that environment that we have in Ireland works to both agendas, but particularly to address that internationalisation agenda where we feel that we have a uniqueness that we can bring to that discussion uh, around regions next year. Just, uh, I think it's frozen. Another point just to show you that yes, of course, we're avidly building our indigenous industries, we're avidly supporting our SMEs, and absolutely ensuring that our regional approach is reflective of good ways of working to do that. One point I would make is that within the framework programme, Ireland is currently ranked number one in terms of our SME participation in the programme per 100,000 SMEs in the country. And so a very interesting model, one that perhaps you could use your time in Ireland to actually take a look at what we're doing and to see can you learn from that. We're growing a number of research-driven clusters. I've given an example here of one of our clusters in Cork, which is very much around foods, uh, intelligent uh, new ingredients, for example, very simply bringing together the multinationals we have, the indigenous companies we have, and the research excellence, uh, the activities going on. So uh, that essentially is the type of environment that we have in Cork. I just wanted to make one point to you that our uh, southern and eastern region is actually ranked 19th of the top 50 regions in terms of FP7 signed grant agreements. And so that's 19th out of, I think, a total of 258. So again, an interesting story to tell there. Our use of FP7 has been very effective, plays a huge contribution in a region like Cork, and we'd be delighted to tell you about it if you can travel over next year. Just a reminder of the date, uh, dates from the 5th to the 7th of June. It's this week next year, if you're wondering. And I suppose just to make the point that we'll run the conference through to Friday, so if you're looking at extending to stay for the weekend, for example, you'll see that we have a whole range of other regional activities that might be of interest. <laughs> so we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much <laughs> for, for the invitation, Clara. So this is the, the final minute, minute of, of the, the conference because we are two, two organizers. So, so let's let us say it. Uh, together. So, so thank you very much for coming and of course uh, see you in, in Ireland, but also because of this continuous work we, we have to do, so see you at, at the different uh, working groups, high level groups and, and, and contributing to the development of all, all these strategies. So thank you very much for, for coming to Krakow. Thank you very much Andre, thank you to you all and thank you also to my colleagues who have been working a lot for this conference. Thank you very much and see you thank next you. year.